Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, really appreciate you joining in. Um, this is the first um, seminar um, that we'll be doing as part of the Virtual Brewers Conference. So uh, good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, so my name is Kevin Weaver, uh, president of Brewmation. I'm gonna be uh, bringing to you here a bunch of information. We're gonna talk about brewing automation and controls. Um, just a quick note, you guys can uh, put some questions up on the right-hand side. Um, see someone already said hello from Brazil. That's amazing. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Um, so this is, um, this is great. We're gonna get right into it here. We got about an hour and we will um, go ahead and um, go through everything, um, perhaps answer a few questions along the way. Uh, when we get to the end, there will be a, a Q and A. Um, so welcome everybody and, and uh, we'll get started. I'm gonna take my video off just so you can uh, get a better screenshot here. All right, so a couple of things that we're gonna do here. We're gonna, um, uh, we've already done some introductions. I'm seeing all sorts of uh, hellos from anywhere from Finland, Canada. Uh, I see a San Antonio, that's amazing. Um, so we even got a Long Island, New York, so close to us. But um, uh, again, good morning, everybody, and good afternoon. So what we're gonna go through here, um, a couple of things. We're gonna talk about art versus science. Uh, we're also gonna talk about um, the automation as it applies to each step of the brewing process. And then we'll get into some uh, levels of controls. Uh, so getting right into it here. Um, so when we start talking about um, the process, and this is so true, I'm not sure really if an ancient brewing proverb came up with this, but it's an amazing statement that anyone can brew a great beer, but a good brewer can brew it again. Um, it's very true. I know for myself that um, back um, a long time ago, too long that I'd care to admit, when I was first starting brewing, I made an amazing Pilsner. I mean, it was just fantastic and everyone loved it. Um, and I don't mean just love it because yeah, Kevin, nice beer, but really it was a really good Pilsner. Um, and then after that, I tried to brew that Pilsner again and I made so many um, bad beers uh, trying to recreate it. Uh, it, was, it was just terrible. So, you know, we all have that appreciation that you can come up with a good beer, but that repeatability is, um, is actually key. Obviously, if you have your own brewery and you're uh, professional brewing. Um, so my own story, that's kind of where the whole automation thing came, came to be. So uh, we, we've been working on it for quite a while. Um, so, of course, the art of brewing. Um, and, and it's worth bringing up because when we start talking about automation, a lot of people uh, fear that they're going to lose the art, they're going to lose the craft. Um, but um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. Obviously, the, the art of brewing, it's a pursuit of a goal. You have a goal, you have a vision, um, what you want your beer to be, what you want it to taste like, what impression, um, the whole craft behind it. Uh, you start exploring ingredients, flavors, styles, um, you're perfecting and developing your recipes. And obviously with the result, you wanna create something new and you wanna put your stamp on it. And automation doesn't have to get in the way of any of that. In fact, it's going to help. Um, and that's where the science of brewing comes in. When we look at the science of brewing, we're looking at the control over the entire process. Um, as we talked about just a bit ago, the ability to rebrew a beer, um, the ability to tweak a process to parameters that achieve the goal. And obviously it's gonna enable you to explore flexibility and creativity. Um, so in other words, you know, when you, when you go, go and you make that beer, just like I made that Pilsner, um, you wanna say to yourself, you know what, how am I gonna recreate that? What was my exact um, temperatures? What flow rates that I have, all of that. Um, and the same token, you know, you may not get lucky and brew that great beer the first time out of the shoot. You might find that it's a little bit too sweet, a little bit too dry, so you want to adjust your temperatures, but you, you need to know where you were for, the, for that time frame. You know, was it a design flaw or was it a system flaw? Um, so that, that's, that's really where that science of brewing comes in. When we look at that, oops, I think I went the wrong way here. Um, automation facilitates the science and science facilitates the art. So this is a great graphic here just to kind of explain that. Everything mixes together. Uh, automation certainly does not destroy the craft. Uh, it just enables you to be um, more creative, more flexible, and more repeatable.
John Kalinowski here. I'm just jumping in. It seems we lost audio uh, for Kevin. Give us a minute and we'll uh, we'll figure that out. All right, can you guys hear me? This is John here. Great. Seems Kevin's having some uh, technical difficulties on his end, so so I'll jump in here. And I think where uh, where we left off, Kevin was talking about how the automation facilitates the science, and the science is what enables you to practice the art. And so, what does automation look like in a brewery environment? <clears throat> And what we're going to do is, is kind of step you through the different vessels, the different processes in the brew house. So starting with the hot liquor tank, you know, obviously one of the one of the most important aspects of brewing is uh, getting your temperatures and, and hitting all your temperatures. Um, you know, getting your strike water up to temp uh, so that you can hit your your mash temp. And maintaining that set point is critical to the brewing process. Uh, you know, the strike and mash temp consistency is what will enable you to uh, rebrew that beer, that pilsner that you're after. Uh, and having that temperature control will help you to avoid overshooting. So, you know, by the, by the, whether it's a PID controller or just a set point controller, uh, avoiding overshoot on your, uh, on heating up your strike water uh, will save you time. And, and we'll see at the end how all of these aspects of automation can uh, shorten your brew day. And it will enable you to have predictable results. So here we're seeing the heater controls, and this is just kind of a, a snapshot of one of the control panels that, that we build at BrewNation. Uh, and whether it's electric steam or direct fire, we can automate that heating process so in the case of electric, we'd be controlling the power going to the elements. In the case of steam, we'd be controlling the valve that's sending steam to your jacketed, uh, jacketed tank. And in the case of direct fire, we can control the burner output uh, you know, with a constant feedback loop of measuring the temperature in the tank and then uh, either turning on the, this electric steam or direct fire to, uh, to get us back up. We also have a preheat timer, which is a really nice feature. And uh, you know, if you're listening in on some of the other webinars, uh, you'll hear more about that. But the preheat timer allows you to set the hot liquor tank to come on, for example, at two in the morning, so that um, when you get to your brew house, your your liquor is all it's all heated up and, and ready for strike in. And this is particularly true uh, on electric systems. Uh, but can also be the case on on steam and potentially even direct fire, depending on you know your local regulations. Um, so it allows your your strike water to come up to temp before you get there, but also um, allows sort of your uh, the temperature of the of the liquor in the vessel to equalize with the vessel itself. The tank itself, um, you know, may be bringing down the the temperature of the strike water. So uh, Having that time to preheat uh, allows you to hit the ground running when you get into the brewery in the morning. We can also include circulation uh, so that you don't get any dead zones or, or cool spots in your uh, in your HLT, especially with larger HLTs. Um, you know we can see a temperature gradient from the, the the bottom of the tank where the heating elements are to the top of the tank. So by having a circulation pump, we can ensure even heat distribution throughout the HLT, which will make it easier to dissolve your uh, water additions, your, your salts. Um, and then we can use an automated switch to strike over from the recirculation or to switch over from the recirculation 
to your strike in when you're ready to uh, when you're ready to start brewing. And in that in that same circuit, that same pipe work, uh, we can include a flow meter that's measuring the the water flow from your HLT into your mash tun uh, to uh, to ensure that you know to measure the volume and make sure that your your ratio of grain to to uh, to water is is what you're looking for. And then these last couple points, uh, not depicted on this particular control panel, but the blending of hot and cold water. A lot of folks are using either uh, a CLT, a cold liquor tank, or or city water, uh, and mixing it with with the hot water. Uh, and the purpose there is so that you can heat up water to temperatures above what you want to strike in at. Um, which will then enable to use that water as, uh, you know, for CIP or for other other parts of the process. Uh, so it allows you to maintain a higher uh, liquor tank temperature and then blend it down with colder water to hit your your strike temps. And so we can automate that that process as well, the mixing valves uh, to achieve the consistent strike temps, um, have less operator interaction, and the ability to auto switch over uh, from the uh, you know, from your cold liquor tank or from your city water to run through your uh, plate heat exchanger for knockout. So that's the HLT. Moving into mashing, and what we have on the screen here is a visual of sort of uh, one of our touchscreen interfaces. This happens to be a, a steam system. Uh, but we have all the controls at our fingertips. Uh, this is the controls for the brew house. So focusing on on mashing, um, you know we can we can automate the mixing and blending process, um, the the grain conveying rate, uh, and and ensuring that you're um, you know you're getting your proper grain measurements into the mash tun. And we have a number of sort of automated processes and pieces of equipment that will. Uh, weigh out the grain as it's being fed into the into the mash tun, and then as I mentioned earlier, measuring the volume of the water that's going into the uh, mash tun to get your to get your ratios. Hey John, I uh, I made it back. Um, my apologies for the technical difficulty there. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll hand it back over to um, you. Where we're just uh, uh, touch. We just got into the mashing uh, automation. All right. Well, sorry about that, everybody. I had a little uh, computer issue, and uh, I'm back. Uh, kicking in here, and um, you know, here we are on the uh, the mashing control. Uh, just started catching a little bit of of what John was talking about here. But when we look at the the temperature control, that's critical, and how to um, uh, actually control that. On um, it's it's different for every all three of the. Um, um, types of breweries. So on electric brewery, uh, for changing the heat and stepping your temperatures, you have rims and herms. Uh, for direct fire, um, you're gonna be looking at either direct heat, um, some people will do herms. Um, and for steam, uh, you could do uh, a steam jacket control. And with that, what we end up doing is um, controlling the volume of steam that is going into the jacket. Uh, so you know, obviously you want a gentle heat going in and. Uh, as you do and step uh, heat and maintain or step your mashes. So you definitely don't want to put a full full amount of steam on the jacket. Um, so all three of those are different ways that you can control and maintain heat in the mound. Um, so timing is obviously uh, another very critical aspect. And there's a lot of different ways to uh, do the automation with that. Um, there's different mash steps, obviously. Those are different times that you want to um, do uh, you know the different steps maybe you're going to be 20 minutes maybe only 15 minutes um, so the controls here in the automation can be to automatically step through your mash temperatures at a certain period of time and do that automatically or you could set the timer just to trigger that yes the operator needs to come back and make that change so different different options uh, but obviously timing is a very um, uh, very key part you could also begin uh, time and begin watering when you, um, oh, we got a question there, but um, automatically switch over to the laudering. Um, so I have a question here um, on the Herms coil, 
with electric. Um, actually, um, not sure what the actual question is, so I apologize, but we will we'll come back to that. <laughs> Sorry about that, it didn't come up on my screen properly. Uh, circulation is another very big uh, part of it, and there's different things that you, you could um, you know, put some technology and automation behind. Uh, the circulation speed has a lot of effects on the mesh. Um, you wanna get a good circulation going, not too fast, you obviously don't wanna stick your mesh. And also you're, what you're looking for is to get a nice circulation so you can get a nice even heat. So that circulation becomes key, um, having a variable speed drive, uh, perhaps even automating the different steps. So there's a lot of options on the circulation side. Uh, sparging. So here's, there's quite a bit you could do on sparging. Um, one of the, the bigger things is to equalize the flow uh, from the runoff to the sparge. So in essence, maintaining that liquid level. Uh, there's a number of ways to automate that. Um, I've seen it done with sensors on level. Uh, that's one, uh, one way to go. You could have a, a level that you set and dial in. I wanna stick with that level. And the control loops would actually run those pumps at different speeds to maintain that level. Another uh, more straightforward way um, is to actually run two pumps that are putting out the same amount of volume. Um, you'll see that in the next slide, a peristaltic pump is a perfect uh, solution for that, uh, running at variable speeds. So basically if you, have, you set your liquid level and you have the same amount of liquid coming in on your hot liquor and you have the same amount coming out going to the kettle, you're gonna maintain that liquid level. So that's a nice way to do the automation. Um, so here you see a picture on the right that um, just highlighted. That's the parasaltic pump I was talking about. Um, you know, they can be used for sparging. They're a nice way to go for sparging um, uh, the hot liquor and then uh, also emptying out into the kettle. Um, I do have a question that did come up. Um, and the question is, I, I do, I step mashed most brews. Should I set the hot liquor tank to 180 degrees to do the steps? Um, 180 degrees is is probably a little bit high. You have to keep in mind that when you're circulating your uh, wart going through the uh, Hearn's coil, what you don't want to have happen is that you start killing off the enzymes. Now, as soon as that wart hits the coil, it's going to cool off. Um, so you're not going to have a lot of contact at that 180 degrees, but you have to be mindful of that. Um, if you do get too high, those enzymes are going to start to uh, deteriorate. So, uh, thank you so much for that question, Mike. Um, so back on the, on the sparging, um, you wanna uh, monitor your, um, you know, your speeds for sparging because uh, you don't wanna have any channeling as well. So if you're sparging too fast, you'll end up uh, you know, getting some channeling going on. It's going to be um, you know, starting to uh, flow through to one side or the other. Um, so you have to be careful of the speed. So having that, that speed on there is a really good, um, uh, the speed control is a really good method. And also you wanna monitor the transfer volume into the kettle. Um, so you could do that either by the speed of the pump. Uh, so that's one of those um, settings that you could have that you really keep an eye on and, and, and utilize from brew to brew. Uh, you could also put a flow meter in there. So if you do have the flow meter, you're gonna know exactly how much volume you're going to the kettle and also what the rate is going into the kettle. Another uh, really uh, good piece of automation comes if you're using a grant. Um, and if a lot of you have used a grant before, then what you'll find is that you're constantly turning the pump on and off or fiddling with valves to get a, that perfect flow out of the grant. Because the first thing you're gonna do is set your, your gravity feed. You want that mash ton to just do its thing naturally. But where the automation comes in is, is to set up so that the grant empties without you having to be at the grant constantly throughout the entire sparge session. So what can be done there is you put um, sensors in to monitor that liquid level, and then you're gonna vary the speed of the pump that's pumping out of the, out of the grant. So um, what we end up doing is we put two floats in there. One is a high level, one is a low level. Uh, so what happens is as it fills up, the grant will trigger that low level and it'll turn the pump on automatically, uh, which is a nice feature because you do not want to run that pump dry. Um, so in addition to you know, getting a nice flow, you have to be careful if you run the pump dry, you're, going to start destroying and wearing out your seals. So having that low float to have it turn on automatically um, is, is a nice setup. But if you just have one float, what can happen is that you're going to turn that pump on and off pretty rapidly, uh, which could also start you know, causing some issues with the pump and, and the motor starts overheating. 
So if you have a second float, which is usually set a little bit higher, closer to the top, what happens is you start when it hits the bottom float, it'll go at a slow speed and that liquid level will start raising up as you're pumping over. Now, if it hits that top level switch, then it's just going to get to a higher speed until it gets down to the lower switch and then it starts that cycle all over. That's a very nice way to, to handle uh, an auto grant setup. Um, another piece of automation is that you could um, take a look and monitor in line your pH conversions, uh, pH levels, I should say. Uh, there are sensors that you could um, install into the tank in line as you're, you're doing watering. Um, so you could, you could really get a nice idea of where the mash is, if it's done its job. Um, one little word of caution, though, with the pH uh, sensors is they have to be calibrated quite often. So, you know, before every uh, batch, you're typically um, comparing it to a known pH and you have to do a calibration. So um, it, it's a little bit um, of, a, of a challenge, but it can certainly uh, yield some great results if you have that, um, that information available to you. So we get to boiling and whirlpooling. Um, one of the real major um, pieces of automation is having precise control over the power that's going into the kettle. And the reason is, is that it, it affects a lot more than a lot of folks realize. Um, if, if you're not able to, you know, some of the obvious ones, you know, you want to be able to uh, control your boil over um, to, to lower that heat. Um, so if you're doing it with electric, um, you know, we have PWM circuits that you can install uh, that will automatically or uh, for a boil over automatically if you have a sensor or manually uh, adjust the heat output of the heating elements. Um, for steam, it's going to be the same thing, but with a valve, uh, we put an automated valve in there to control how much steam uh, is actually going into the jacket. Uh, some little word of caution there is that uh, the, the reaction time on steam could be a little bit long, so you have to be early in predicting when that actual boil over is going to happen. Uh, direct fire, uh, same thing. If you have modulated controls on your burner, you can turn your heat down. So having that precise power control can prevent those boil overs. Also scorching. Uh, when you're filling up, if you have a very um, high gravity beer, your first runnings are going to be very, um, very thick, much higher gravity. Um, so you have to be careful there that you're not putting too much power into the kettle because uh, you're going to do some scorching. And that, that's in all three of those, um, uh, those aspects, you know, the electric, um, steam, and, and direct fire. But where it really comes in is the predicting the evaporation rates. Um, so once you get a nice rolling boil, to be able to repeat your evaporation rate is, is very crucial. Um, you're going to be looking at what your volumes are at the end. That's going to affect your final gravities. Um, if you end up having to boil longer to get to that, that exact gravity, now you're going to have some more hop utilization rates. Um, so having that number set and having that repeatable from brew to brew is very important. Um, electric is quite easy to do. You can set your, um, your percent output with that PWM I was talking about. And that will allow you to um, adjust that output to, as an example, 62%. Uh, with steam, it's the same thing. Um, you have a valve that um, is open zero to 100%. So you know if you open that valve to 42%, then you have that same volume of power, in essence, which is the steam going into the jacket to cause that evaporation. So the key is to be very repeatable um, in that process. Um, another thing is hop dosing time. Uh, that could be automated as well. Um, it could be as simple as giving you remote alerts of when to, um, you know, a little alarm goes off at a certain time to tell you that you can go ahead and put the hops in. Um, I've also seen automatic dispensers that can automatically trigger that you're going to put your hop additions in at certain times. Um, a lot of times that's going to be in your bigger breweries, but uh, there's no reason that could not be implemented in a smaller uh, craft brewery. So there's a lot of, a lot of different things you can do for hop dosing. Um, obviously, your timing, um, you know, monitor when to stop your boil at a set time. That could be automated that when the time is up, you go immediately into a knockout. Um, another um, interesting part of automation or a possibility is specific gravity monitoring. Um, there are sensors out there that can give you a specific gravity, um, so give you some real-time readings so that you know exactly where you are during the boil. Uh, one of the tricky parts there is that these, um, these sensors um, are typically not rated for the boil temperature. So you have to, as it pumps through, it's going to go through a little cooling coil. Um, but it's a, a pretty slick way to get some real-time uh, specific gravity readings, and you can do some controls based on that. Uh, getting into whirlpool speed, 
having a variable speed drive, um, automating and being uh, repeatable on how fast you're actually uh, doing your circulation. Uh, that is, there's a lot of different formulas out there, um, you know, but having that ability to say, okay, on this particular brew, I wanna get a whirlpool going at X speed um, is definitely another parameter that you can control and automate. Uh, getting on to uh, wort cooling. So um, temperature control on wort cooling is obviously the name of the game there. And there's a lot of things that you can control and automate. When you're looking at the, um, the you know, maintaining the plate chiller output temperature, there's a lot of things that affect that. Um, your flow of wort coming from the kettle, if you're going too fast, you're gonna have higher temperatures. If you're going slow, you're gonna have lower temperatures. Um, the other part of it is controlling the flow of your water. If you're um, doing a single stage or water and glycol, if you're doing a dual stage, you could set your glycol at a set volume because that's gonna be off of your loop, uh, but you can control the flow of the water in order to maintain the flow of the wort. Um, so if you're really targeting a 45 minute or 30 minute cool down, then what you're gonna do is set your volume uh, flowing through and you can monitor that with a uh, flow meter, or you can go ahead and, um, uh, you know, do a loop on that so so it will automatically um, do the flow. But typically, you want to have that flow be constant and then put the control loop on the water flow. Um, and that water flow will be based off of uh, the temperature probe that I might have pictured there. That'll be on the output of the chiller. So your control loop um, runs, that, uh, runs in that way. Um, so that's going to do a lot of things for you. It's going to maintain that output. It's going to reduce your time to pitching because you're going to make sure that you hold to that 30 minutes or whatever your number happens to be. Um, Word flow control, um, you know, basically that's what I'm talking about is, is controlling that flow through the heat exchanger, get consistent knockout times, nice steady flow through a hot back as an example. Um, if you're running very fast through the hot back, you may not pick up as many of the hot lipids. Um, if you're going slow, that might be preferable. So that wort flow control with a flow meter can certainly give you a lot of valuable information. And of course, measure volume into the fermenter. Uh, so you wanna know how much you get out of, the, um, out of your batch and into the fermenter. That's where a flow meter can certainly help out. Uh, oxygenation, uh, you can certainly control the flow of the oxygen to the stone. Uh, there are different um, uh, feedback centers, sen uh, sensors to uh, or I should say valves, to monitor and actually adjust that flow of oxygen. It's always a difficult thing to, um, you know, with a needle valve or, or how you do inject it when you're coming out of the, um, uh, the chiller and, and through an oxygenation stone, is to get that just right. And typically it's done by hand um, and visual. Uh, that can still be done, but there are definitely sensors that you could uh, utilize to create a uh, control loop. And a lot of times that's on some of the bigger breweries, but um, again, the technology is there and um, uh, the costs are not actually um, too far out to, to actually do that, and get repeatable results for injecting oxygen. Um, you know, obviously uh, having, having control over that, you're gonna control your quality over oxygenation, under oxygenation is gonna cause you issues. Uh, it's gonna save on your O2 usage. And we get into celery. Um, Cellaring automation, uh, there's, there's a lot of different things you can do. Obviously, the temperature is one of the big ones. Uh, you want to, if you have your uh, jacket of tanks, um, which typically it would be for anything over a two barrel, uh, you're going to control your temperature by turning on and off your, your glycol, um, glycol flow to the jackets based on the temperature that you're measuring in the system. Um, but there are different, um, different things you could do with that. A lot of folks want to do a feedback back loop in order to ferment at different temperatures at different times, get some different flavor profiles, et cetera. Um, we've actually even um, taken a look at, at changing those temperatures based on how quickly you are actually fermenting. So if you're starting to ferment too fast and we're able to sense that with a pressure sensor, we could actually um, lower that temperature in order to control the, the rate of fermentation. So there are several control loops and some things that um, we've been working on that um, you know, can really really put a lot more technology and automation into the cellaring controls other than just maintaining one temperature. Um, so, you know, timing, um, you know, scheduling and monitoring fermentation temps. If you did want to step it, you're going to want to take a look at the timing, automatically make it switch over. Um, lagering schedules are very important for that. So if you're uh, making a logger, you're going to want to make sure that you kick down into your lagering temps. And then of course, monitoring how long that you'll be doing that, doing disole rests, 
uh, all of that could be automated. Um, hop dosing can be done um, in different ways. You could add some automation to that where you're going to hop dose using some CO2. Uh, if you have a hop doser that it will automatically kick the CO2 on, open a valve and dump the hops in for you um, at a particular schedule. Uh, some pretty neat things you could do there. Um, record keeping. You know, keeping record and, and logging data can certainly be considered automation. Um, if you're maintaining, um, you know, uh, your, your actual temperatures, taking a look at your temperatures, looking at, you know, did, did you hit the temperatures? Did anything happen? If you start really getting a, a fermentation that is uh, running a little bit too hard, it's going to um, increase your temperature and maybe the glycol chiller is not going to um, be keeping up with that load. You can identify some issues there. Um, so record keeping becomes a nice, um, uh, a very nice automation feature. Um, and another one uh, that we've been doing some work on is uh, monitoring the stages of fermentation. Uh, we've taken a look at using, I mentioned a little bit before about um, monitoring the pressure on a uh, fermenter. And we could look at the changes in the pressure uh, as it's actually going through an, an airlock and determining which stage the, um, uh, the fermentation is in. So that's a pretty interesting, um, an interesting technology and automation that opens up a lot of different doors. So that's a, it's a very interesting and, and powerful tool that um, comes into the automation portion of things. So how you, how you automate is obviously up to you. There's, there's a lot of things to consider. Um, I just went through all sorts of different things and it doesn't mean that all of them are for you. Um, there's different ways to approach these controls, uh, different ways to implement automation. So as an example, you could go with a very basic type control panel. In fact, you could even go more basic than what we're showing here, where you can have individual um, uh, controls on different tanks. So it could just be uh, you know, a Johnson, uh, Johnson controller, et cetera, and that's automation. So you have to kind of take a look at what your goals are, how far you want to take it. Um, when we look at a basic control panel like this one here, um, it does take care of necessary automation requirements. It'll do the hot liquor tank temperature control. It can do a RIMS control or HERMS control, uh, give you that output. Uh, you see the knob there for the output for your uh, kettle. Um, so it'll take care of a lot of the necessities. Um, and a lot of times it can also be expanded to include, um, you know, valves and, and uh, valve controls and, and things along those lines. Uh, it does allow for a more hands-on brew day. Um, some folks uh, like uh, to actually hit switches rather than push on a touchscreen. So, and it's also a budget-minded control uh, technology. So you can go with more basic and, you know, there's absolutely, absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, and then the other side of things is you can go for a little bit more of an advanced type system. Um, so, you know, there's really the sky's the limit when you're looking at PLC controls. Um, you know, you have an endless automation potential. Uh, we hit on all sorts of different points, but uh, there's setups that you could have everything on automatic valves, whether they're pneumatic valves or they're electrically actuated butterfly valves. Um, the entire process can certainly be automated. And again, with the craft sometimes or all the time, it's that balance of how far you take it how far you want to maintain some more of the hands-on decisions as you go through. Um, so again, endless potential. Uh, Got to consider data collection. If you want to have recipes, which is very nice to have when you're talking about repeatability. Uh, remote access is a very big one so that you could actually dial in and um, see what your system's doing. Perhaps you're not the brewer, you're the owner, and you want to make sure that your brewer is doing, uh, doing the job that you're hoping that they're doing. You could certainly uh, set up a system along those lines. Um, John was probably explaining the uh, hot liquor tank timer. Um, if, if you wanted to set that timer or you say, okay, you wake up at uh, five o'clock in the morning, you could dial in, set your hot liquor tank to turn on and then get your way into work and, and then start your brew day. So it can certainly be a time saver. Um, so all of this, it's expandable and it allows the brewer to really multitask uh, as they're going through the process instead of like, um, you know, for the ward grant, hanging over the ward grant and adjusting valves, you could have the automation take care of things and clean kegs or do the million things that the brewer has to do. So Ruth, what's right for you? Well, as I mentioned here, no matter what level of automation you choose, you will certainly find that automation is a very important part of your brewery. Um, it gives you better control, higher repeatability, shorter brew days, 
certainly tons of cost savings depending on, on where and how you automate uh, a lot of different uh, operator efficiencies and better ability to do what you love, which is uh, to craft some great beer. So I'm gonna put my video back on here. Um, again, I apologize for the um, difficulty. My computer decided to do an upgrade in the middle of uh, the presentation, so glad John was here to, to kick in. But um, I'm going to go ahead and try to, to get to some of the questions here. And, uh, Kevin, one of the questions that, that came up um, was when you were talking about electric steam and, and direct fire, what the best choice is. And uh, for those listening, we have a webinar on that tomorrow at noon Eastern time, but maybe you can give us a little preview of, of that one, Kevin. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's um, always a question. Um, you know, which which one is a better a better technology? And and you know, we are going to go through that. Um, we're going to talk about um, some of the different items of uh, the different benefits, uh, pros and cons of brewing the electric, brewing uh, steam, and brewing direct fire. Um, so we have a pretty nice um, nice comparison um, on on all fronts there. Um, since this is automation, I can kind of touch on that a little bit where, you know, when you're automating one of those systems or all of those systems, um, uh, to me, and again, it's my, my opinion, is the electric is easier to automate when you're looking at heat because you have very, very precise and immediate feedback control. Um, steam is very close. Uh, you're able to control that with, um, with your control valves. Um, as long as you have those set up, you know, we, we use automated or um, motorized globe valves. Um, direct fire, it depends on how you set that up. If it's an on-off control, uh, usually it's turning the heat on, turning the heat off, um, or if you have a modulating burner. Uh, if you do have a modulating burner, that could be very handy as well. So kind of a lot of pros and cons, but we'll, we'll definitely do a deeper dive into that um, when, uh, when we do that. I'm not sure when is that one, John, that particular um, seminar? Eastern time tomorrow. Excellent. Okay, um, so let's see here. We got a lot of questions. Um, John, you want to throw me up a couple questions? Is that easy to do? Quick one. Uh, what's the difference between PLC and PID? Um, so PID control um, and a P, well, a PLC can, is what provides the different control types. So when you're looking at temperature and you're looking at a, an actual true PID loop, as compared to an on-off controller, you know, those are really the two types. So let's just say in a hot liquor tank that um, you're heating up, you have it set for 165 degrees. With an on-off controller, as soon as it hits 165 degrees, it's gonna shut off your heat. With a PID loop, what that's doing is it's doing a predictive control. So as the temperature is rising, getting close to that 165 degree mark, the system knows how quickly it's, it's ramping up. So it'll start backing off on the heat so that once it gets to that 165, you're at the maintaining temperature because that hot liquor tank is going to be you know, giving off heat, losing heat at a particular rate, and the PID learns from itself and knows what that rate is. So it'll know, say, the output's going to be 60%, or that well, would be kind of high. Maybe it's 40% to maintain that temperature. Then it'll be sitting at 40% just as you get to the set point, and it'll maintain it, so it'll prevent an overshoot. Um, so sometimes a PID loop um, is a fantastic way to do the control. Other times it becomes a little bit too complex and a simple on-off control would do the trick. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. That's the two types. What else we got? Um, an, an option uh, when it comes to automating? Say that again? An option on the automation controls. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we we were talking about this recently on our side, um, and it, you know, it's it's any supplier really that you know allows for you know doing different customizations. Um, we've been finding that a good majority of our panels lately have been uh, customizations, and it may be something slight, um, and uh, other ones might be something very very um, uh, complex. I guess I would, you would say something that's outside of the norm, but absolutely customization is not a problem. Um, you know, that gives us great ideas and um, gets us a chance to get our R&D uh, unit set up, so. On different types of sensor technology, and I'll wrap these into one, uh, Ronald asks, have you incorporated pressure sensors for water levels? And similarly, Thomas asks, have you tried or tested 
uh, reading density during the boil? Yeah, so um, pressure sensors for level, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that you're talking about uh, more of a weight sensor. Um, um, well, actually, no, I get you now. Yeah, so pressure sensors can be used, um, and actually I've done that in a different industry, but um, where you have the pressure of the, the liquid in the tank and you're monitoring that. Um, you, you can do that. One of, the, one of the tricky parts is if you're doing a circulation, uh, that's gonna, of course, throw off your, your, uh, your pressure because you're getting a lot of movement in that tank. But um, no, that can be done. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting um, way to think about it because that could give you a full zero to 100% level detection, uh, especially if you're looking at fermenters where you're not doing circulation. So um, uh, yeah, absolutely. That is, that is certainly um, a nice way to go. I was talking about weight sensors. You could also uh, put on the tanks and, and get a zero weight before you put the, put the material, um, you know, which would be the liquid into the tank. Uh, so that's another method of doing level detection where you're not having a probe actually in, in, the, uh, in the liquid. Um, and in uh, gravity readings, is that right? On the kettle was the other question, John? That's right. <clears throat> Yeah, there's um there's a sensor, and I, I kind of hit on that a little bit when we were talking. That um, will actually measure the specific gravity of the wort um, in line, meaning that you actually pump a small amount through it. Um, I hope I don't mispronounce it, but it's it's the Coriolis effect, um, where in a in a nutshell, what you're doing is 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 putting a sound, an ultrasonic sound, or an ultrasonic vibration, I should say, um, across the sensor as the liquid passes through, and they're able to figure out. Uh, exactly what that density is. Um, and it's, it's an interesting technology on the distilling side. Uh, we use it to find out um, you know, how, how much alcohol is actually in, in, the, um, uh, in, in the vodka or whatever you're making in the liquor. Uh, but the same technology is used to kind of come up with the density. Uh, so on a kettle, the, 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 the temperature uh, levels, I think you have to be down about 185. Um, that's off the top of my head, it might be different, but uh, around 185, but certainly not boiling. Um, but we found when we did some tests on that, that we just go through a small coil and that cools it enough that by the time it hits that sensor and then it pumps back into the kettle, uh, you're below that temperature and you can get a reading. So, uh, yeah, that technology is there. Absolutely. Daryl asks, are automation software platforms typically PC based and can they be updated without a programmer? Um, you know, it, it depends on the on the control platform. Um, you know, the the embedded type system is is um, you know more more standard in automation packages, uh, meaning it's not you know Windows based system. Um, as I experienced just a little bit ago, um, having a Windows based system can be unpredictable. Um, and so it knocked me right out of uh, the conference here. So myself, I kind of shy away a little bit from the Windows environment um, because you you have a lot. It's a lot. Of control that you give up. If there's bugs, you have to rely on on the Windows platform and Microsoft to to fix that bug, and then you end up kind of chasing that on a software side of things. Um, but on the flip side of that, though, on a positive, um, I know it's used very commonly. Um, so having being on like a, a Windows PC platform has a ton of benefits as well because it makes it a lot easier to get into Excel spreadsheets and um, you know all sorts of different apps. So. Um, really on a batch type control, which the brewing process is, it's really not a bad technology. So those are kind of the two, the two things, you know, to weigh. Um, the question of, you know, being able to modify it um, yourself. I know there's, there's uh, suppliers that do offer out the code and it's, it's a very simplistic code to, to go through and try to modify yourself. But, um, you know, it's, depends on, on, on what you're looking to do. Um, there's also some, Arduino boards and things like that, that you could, um, you know, kind of customize yourself. Um, you know, I know on our side that, um, you know, we're using uh, the PLC uh, ladder logic. And if you really didn't know that, it, it could be a bit complex and you can kind of get yourself into trouble with trying to trying to program it. So um, we're always wide open to making changes to, um, you know, the software. If there's a, a feature that somebody wants, then, you know, that's uh, very easy for us to do. We have um, software folks on staff to do it. And that's kind of been our approach. John asks, uh, what is involved with adding additional equipment, such as fermenters, to an existing control panel? And does the level of automation affect your ability to expand in the future? That's a great question. Um, you know, on, on our side, we, um, 
we ran into that in the beginning where we would sell um, or provide eight point uh, panels. So in essence, you had eight fermenters. And then someone would come back and say, okay, I'm expanding. I want to put another two. And, you know, we try to catch that in the beginning and, and you know, go to a 12 point panel. Uh, but then of course the 12 point, and also someone wants 14, et cetera. So it became a matter of, all right, well, if you had an eight point, then we take the eight point back and do a trade to a 12 point. But um, so that, that became obvious as all the, the smaller breweries started expanding and really brewing uh, quite more often and uh, finding the capacity was in the fermenters. So we were having a lot more than eight points and even more than 12 points. So what we do on our platform, and I'm not sure, I think others do it as well. Um, we do modules now. So everything is module based. So what we'll do is provide an eight point panel. This is on the PLC um, uh, ones, by the way. Uh, so you have an eight point panel that would be up in the ceiling, um, you know, controlling the valves and, and uh, temperatures inputs. And once you go beyond eight, you just simply add another one and that gets daisy chained in with that control loop. So it's basically just a, a, an, an internet cable, network cable going from one panel to the other up in the ceiling. And that really works out well because if you had one um, panel that had 20 some odd uh, tanks from it, uh, you have a lot of wires that are running all over, um, but being able to place each one of those in the cluster of eight um, fermenters or bright tanks really becomes handy. And, and I think we've um, probably the most we've networked so far is about, I think it's five of them. Uh, and that's a lot, but um, it was an interesting project. But um, yeah, and not only that, but expanding to other things. So uh, as an example, if you're going to add a filter press to your system, um, and you already have a PLC and you want to add that, um, we have a module for that. So it's not a whole new system. Basically, it's a module that's going to accept uh, the inputs from the sensors and take care of the outputs to the valves, and then you could um, actually add something like that to the system. So going with that module approach and the PLC platform that we use becomes very easy to um, expand upon. Okay, question came up here, which PLC do we use? Um, well, I tell you, I, um, we use uh, Unitronics, um, and uh, just a little bit of a background on that. I mean, I kind of grew up in, in automation as a PLC um, guy from Alan Bradley. Um, the Alan Bradley controls are, are, are amazing. Um, uh, to us though, they're a little bit too expensive for you know what they do and they, they kind of, uh, a lot of, there's a high level of charging for software and upgrades and things like that. But, um, and I love the product, there's, there's no two ways about it. Uh, to us though, the Unitronics was a nice fit because it did has all the power and then some that we could ever use. And the price level is very, very reasonable. So, you know, we, we know that we have to hit a particular price point on our products and, you know, make it so that the automation is achievable and, and purchasable uh, for these small systems. So, um, so we decided to go with um, uh, the Unitronic system and we've been using that forever. And uh, they have great warranties, although we don't have to use them much, which is good. And they have great support. So, uh, yeah, we use Unitronics. Question here, Mike asked about um, <clears throat> glycol controls. Is it just as simple as a temp control for each tank and a solenoid valve? Um, yeah, th that's that's the, the typical way. We put a solenoid valve or a motorized valve um, on the glycol loop. Uh, so you're going to have a first in, last out on the glycol loop. And, you know, when the, it calls for temperature, it's going to open the valve. Uh, when it reaches uh, your temperature, it's going to close the valve. Um, you could also do, and, and we've done this as well, uh, you could actually do more of a PID type loop. So that would be a variable position um, valve. So you're going to slow the glycol flow or speed up the glycol flow in order to maintain the temperature. Um, to me, the on off control really gives you a tight control just based on the volume. So um, in my opinion, you know, the, the on off for, for the, for that level of and size for you know the sizes that we're looking at as far as the craft brewing really does a nice job and it doesn't really warrant having to do PID loops. Um, once you start getting into bigger tanks, um, we're typically putting in not just the one, but uh, say you have three zones, uh, we can control all three zones. And sometimes that becomes pretty handy because you might end up changing those temperatures of the different zones so you can get some nice um, circulation action going on. Um, you know, as you, as you let, allow it to warm up in the in the bottom, that, that wart's going to raise to the top. What's being cool on the top is going to go to the bottom. So you're going to get that circulation going, and that's that's great for hop utilization. So if you have multiple zones, um, then even though it's still on-off control, you have control over the different uh, the different zones there. So that's a, that's a pretty slick way to go. 
The last couple of questions here are about gravity sensors. Uh, Corey asks, what kind of gravity sensors exist? And another question is, do these sensors need to be calibrated frequently uh, like the pH sensors? Um, there's there's different types of them that that Coriolis one uh, does not need to be calibrated, um, and that would be you know the one that I would I would always take a look at. Um, you know, temperature does take a play in there, and that what they do have they have um, temperature sensors built into them. So there's a little loop inside of these units um, that do a self calibration based on temperature. Um, you know, as far as any other, there, there's a, a number of different ways that um, people have come up with for gravity readings. Um, you know, one of the the other one, not, not necessarily a gravity reading, but kind of let you know where you are in the fermentation process is to look at the pressure and to find that, that change of pressure, uh, kind of that, that shift in pressure, I should say. Um, even as you're, you know, exhausting out of, you know, talking about a fermentation here, but exhausting out of the, the airlock. So, you, you know, you kind of get those bubbles that are happening and, and we could see the transitions literally on every one of the bubbles um, and we can correlate how quickly you're fermenting and, and from there determine, you know, when, when you shift the phase in the fermentation. So there's another way to do it without an actual sensor. Um, and, um, you know, that, that shows a lot of promise. It's kind of, kind of the same as like, if you're looking at your bucket, which you always do when you're fermenting, Hey, are we, when did I start fermenting? Well, you look at it and you see a bubble, um, you say to yourself, well, I must've started fermenting just then and there, but it could have happened six hours ago when you were sleeping, when you first, first started getting activity in the, uh, in the fermenter. So when you kind of look at that pressure, you could, you could say, okay, you know exactly when uh, the activity started in the fermenter. And then also as you're fermenting, when you hit your peak, when you come off of the peak, all of that could be recorded based on, on these pressure readings. Um, so I kind of got off on a little bit of a tangent there, but it's kind of a neat um, way to go about it. Um, another question came up here. Um, how have you handled uh, heating fermenters? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the one of the ways to do it would be to have two zones in the fermenters. Uh, this is kind of an easier way to do it, um, where you'll have. Let me make sure I get this right. The upper one will be your um, uh, your cooling, and your lower uh, jacket will be the heating. Um, so when you're, you're cooling, you're just going to be running that loop. And then when you're heating, you're going to be running the other loop. So you're actually heating and cooling in the two sections. And the reason you're, I'm suggesting that you do it that way is because you have your cold loop coming from your glycol chiller, which may even be doing cold rooms, whatever the case may be. So if you have one fermenter you want to heat up. You don't want to heat up all of your glycol. Um, so what you would do is have a separate heated, um, uh, tank. That will be heating the glycol, and that would be another loop that you would run in order to get your heated heated side. Um, you know, that's kind of the way we've done that before, and it's, it's very effective. Uh, we even uh, do something similar to that when we get into the um, distilling side of things, um, where we're heating and cooling and mash tons and everything else. So, um, yeah, nice question. Thank you. I think that's, uh, I think that's all the questions. I think we got to them all. Did we really? Okay. So, uh, one last question came in. Uh, electric okay. system. Um, is there a way to estimate the amount of kilowatt hours consumed before your brew day? Yeah. Um, yeah. It depends. You know, I do have um, a lot. A lot of people ask us. You know, what what their cost is going to be in running an electric system. Um, you know, we we do quite a few of those, so that's a question that comes across the desk quite a bit. So we have a spreadsheet that we take a look at and say, okay, well, if you're going to be doing a 60 minute boil, um, et cetera, um, type in a couple other unknowns. It, it's very easy to predict because, you know, kilowatt, um, you know, really relates to BTUs and kilowatt hours relates to time. So it's a pretty simple spreadsheet. So you can definitely, you know, understand exactly what your kilowatt usage is going to be and then what your cost is going to be. Uh, we do that analysis a lot to, you know, take a look at the comparison between electric you know, steam and gas, natural gas uh, for um, direct fire. And, um, you know, it, it depends. Like if, as an example, if you're in the Caribbean or something like that, then your electric rates could be very high. Um, and that wouldn't make sense. So a lot of times, um, you know, a direct fire or steam makes a lot more sense that way. Um, you know, here we've done the calculations in New York where we have a decent, um, you know, decent rates, a little bit higher. I mean, we're not in the city, we're an hour and a half north of the city, but um, at kind of average electric rates, um, it, it becomes a little bit of a wash between um, electric and steam because electric is 100% efficient. 
almost because you're direct, um, the elements are directly in uh, the, the wart. Where steam, you know, you're looking at 80, uh, if you have a high efficiency, you're gonna be higher than 80%. So that kind of becomes a wash a lot of times. Uh, steam will beat out electric uh, just by a little bit. So they're very comparable. Um, direct fire, you know, there's a lot of heat loss. Uh, so that, you know, certainly becomes a higher uh, energy user, uh, but definitely on cost um, when you look at propane. Uh, propane direct fire becomes very expensive. Um, kind of got off again on a little bit of tangent, but I did have a couple minutes, so. <laughs> Any other questions come in, John? That's everything. All right, well, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I see we have quite a bit of attendees from all over the place. Um, I wanna really thank you for uh, coming and attending this one. Hopefully you're gonna to get to a whole bunch of the other, uh, uh, the other seminars. Um, when we finish this up, you're gonna actually get pumped over to <clears throat> um, another screen that's gonna allow you to uh, schedule some one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations and, some contact information up on the screen for myself, uh, Michael O'Neill, JV and Whitlow. Uh, and we're all uh, part of the donation team here. So feel free to uh, shoot us an email, and if you want to have a one on one and talk about um, the particular automation ideas that you have, and, uh, basically anything, feel free. You know, we, we had this week blocked off to be uh, uh, in Texas for the CBC, so um, we'd love to you know, reach out and chat with everybody. Uh, so feel free to go ahead and use that tool. And, schedule to have a chat. Look forward to talking to you. Thank you so much.